your love Oh, I would do anything And so what I'd like to do now is just uh, give a brief personal uh, inflection uh, to, the, uh, to the evening. I think we all recognize that the publication of City of Night in 1963 that's the turning point in American literature and culture, in part by bringing things to the surface and bringing things together. And you'll hear more about that um, in the program. And I'd just like to uh, end with a personal note about, uh, I was checking my CV, and it, it confirmed for me something that I'd long uh, carried with me, which is the fact that John Ritchie is there in my curriculum vitae. I'm very proud of that because um, my colleague Marsha Kinder back in 1997 um, invited me to take part in a day-long uh, meeting at the Annenberg Center for Communications as they were preparing for what would eventually be released as a CD bomb called Mysteries and Desire, Searching the Worlds of John Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that context, thanks to Marsha, uh, and in the Annenberg Center, I was able to uh, meet uh, John and spend the day with him and take part in a wonderful discussion that explored how to do what John's work has done, which is to break down the borders between things. And in this case, in, 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 with this new technology at the time, how to look across autobiography, memory, and history, and fiction, and understand that there's a more meaningful story being told by mixing these together. And John's work over the last 50 years has certainly exemplified that. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to Hector Calderon and welcome you to our event. Well, I want to thank, first, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, John and the Chicago Studies Research Center for immediately and enthusiastically uh, saying yes uh, to the event and also uh, our two other co-sponsors, uh, one chair is here, Abel Valenzuela from the UCLA Cesare Chavez Center, Chicana and Chicano Studies. And, uh, mm -hmm. It was one of my first hires back in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> we started the Center uh, for Chicana and Chicano Studies. So it's good to see him now here as a full professor and chair. <laughs> <laughs> And also, uh, uh, Randall Johnson, who couldn't be here, but Randall immediately also enthusiastically gave us uh, money no, for, <laughs> for the event. So I, I thank I thank him, too. And then there's uh, someone who's over there who's been my partner in crime in all of this. Yeah. Um, she's a, uh, I don't know, I think we've been emailing on a daily basis. Hours. Through the summer, <laughs> more than once on a daily basis. <laughs> through the summer, and now through the early, through the early fall, from my residence in Mexico City, from my apartment here in Culver City, and she has just been great helping out with with all with all this. Yes. Yesterday when I said I haven't done anything, but I'm just exhausted and tired. <laughs> she was she was here, you know, doing all all that had to be done to prepare for. For the evening, for the afternoon. So, really, a, a big, big, big thank you to Rebecca. It's going to be a, I don't know, sad. But I want to write you three or four times, you know, in the first uh, half hour of the day. So, uh, I thank you for all, for all your assistance. You know, she really did an, an amazing job with, with all of this. You know. And then I also want to thank uh, uh, our presenters. First, uh, David L. Ewan, and you have the little blurbs that I've prepared for you in the, uh, oh, in the uh, uh, program. Um, and David L. Ewan is the, uh, with the LA Times, the, the, the critic for the book review for the LA, LA Times. Uh, he's a transplant <coughs> Easterner from New York, and now uh, an Angelino who has been adding to the city that has no <coughs> authors and no writers, by uh, two anthologies of Los Angeles, of Los Angeles writers. So he's remedying that misconception of Los Angeles as a place without, without writers. You know? So 
I thank him for accepting from an unknown person, Hector Calderon, uh, and saying, would you like to be a part of the 50th anniversary celebration of John Reggie's city uh, of night? And he said, yes, no, immediately. So I thank David no, for, for uh, coming here uh, today. And then uh, we have a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. <laughs> He's gonna, he's gonna kick it around a little bit uh, uh, and tell us something about uh, uh, City of Night and the making of, of L.A. Woman. And, uh, uh, John Densmore is a, a writer, an author in, in his own right. And he's been on a book tour and took time off to come to this, to this event from uh, uh, the book tour of uh, The Doors on the Hinge, you know, his, his latest book about about the doors. No? So, <coughs> two important individuals from Los Angeles, no? from the LA Times and from and from, from the doors, and I'm uh, so pleased that they could be here with us uh, with us today. So uh, and, and when you think of you know Los Angeles and the sixties, it's kind of the sixties out here in some way. When you think of Los Angeles and and, uh, and the sixties and the doors, well you know, it, it, it says it all, that uh, Summer of Love of 1967, mm -hmm. you know, if, if uh, thank you, you know, if, uh, if that song had been shorter, we might not have so many babies that were born in 1967. It was a long way, but we Like my father. So, so uh, everybody, myself who was around here back in 1967 recalls those those days in, uh, in Los Angeles so I thank these two individuals for, for coming out and helping us out with uh, John Reggie and then there is of course uh, uh, the person that we're all here to honor uh, John Reggie and uh, I mean the board that I have doesn't do justice as to who he is but, uh, in a variety of, of ways, you know, beginning in 1958 with uh, these two articles that I have, you know, here for Mardi Gras and El Paso del Norte and the Evergreen Review in 1958. And the Evergreen Review back in the 50s was the, the avant-garde journal you know, literature in the United States. It was known as the Beat uh, Generation Journal that published Kerouac you know, and Ginsburg. And then on the south side of uh, the border, Grove Press, which is affiliated with uh, 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 Evergreen Review, uh, published uh, Pedro Paramo in 1959 and El Abrinto de la Soledad in 1961. And then Grove Press also published in 1963, City of Night. So among all those important individuals of the late 50s, early 60s, there was a Mexican American. John Reggie. So uh, he has carried in a sense the standard bearer for uh, the culture and for us for a long, for a long, long time. You know? And here we're, we're, of course, uh, honoring him for uh, City of Night. It's a book that has been highly influential in film, in art, and in music. And we have here uh, John Densmore to tell us a little bit about the importance of City of Night for uh, for LA for LA woman. And then he also has the, the Miraculous Day of Amalia Gomez, which has become uh, uh, an important book, an important book within Chicano, Chicano literature of, 19, of 1991. You know? And John Reggie is, is also an essayist that he writes for a variety of journals. He's a public intellectual, and he speaks out of those things that are important, that are important to him. And I give just a, a sampling of uh, the themes you know, that John Reggie has written has written about. And then he's he's a master teacher. Yeah. He's a, a master teacher has students who have uh, gone on to, in their own right, receive awards. And so, of course, the applause is from some of those students who are here before for him. So uh, in a variety of ways, you know, an important intellectual within Los Angeles, uh, uh, a presence in, in uh, different fronts, you know, uh, and it's, it, it's my pleasure, uh, really, my pleasure to do this for, for John Reggie. We met back in 1994 here at UCLA at a conference, and then back east in 1996, so uh, he came to visit out back east. And then again here uh, this past uh, May uh, when he was uh, in my class and we really 
videotape an interview with him that's available now, now on YouTube. And uh, knowing him and Michael, who's here, uh, uh, more now, uh, in some ways we've been a committee of three, with Rebecca, myself, and, and John, passing by each other all, you know, the, whether it's the invitation or the program or whatever. Uh, uh, and uh, Rebecca once said, thank you so much for sending his magic my way. And that's how people feel about John, John Gretchen. So he's a, he's a, um, from the heart, he's a, he's a gentleman and a very caring person. And I have found that, that out. Thank so you. I thank for his, for his friendship, no, uh, John Gretchen. What we wanted to do was to give you a different sides of, of John Ritchie. Uh, uh, as you'll see, you know, I'm the one who's going to do the Mexican-American, no, the fellow who was born Juan Francisco Flores <coughs> Ritchie on the border, so uh, that'll be my uh, contribution. Then David uh, Ewan will be next, and then he'll talk about uh, John Ritchie in relationship to uh, uh, Doma, Land of the Free, you know, uh, uh, and he'll, he'll have something to say about another John Ritchie. And then John Densmore will give us the, uh, another John Ritchie, the influence of this writer on music, you know, uh, uh, popular culture and, and the doors. And then we'll hear from uh, the man himself, uh, John Ritchie, uh, uh, at the end. So if you'll bear with me, then I'll give you my two cents worth on John Ritchie, the Mexican-American. So this is John, John So it may be someone that most of you don't know about as John Ritchie, uh, Juan Francisco Flores Ritchie. So I'll just give you first a Can you get my mic? Yeah. Can I hear you? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is it better? Yeah. Yes. So here we go then. Juan Francisco Flores Ritchie. A writer from the Fossil Ciudad Juarez, from Puerto Rico. That's his name, born in, 19, in 1934. He is the son of Mexican immigrants who crossed the U.S. into the U.S. after the, uh, the chaos created by the Mexican Revolution. He is part of the Mexican uh, northward migration uh, of the 20th century, to which many of us in this room, in some way or another, belong belong to, to that, including the Chicano generation or my, my generation. So these were in the Mexican immigrant communities that hugged the border, though in El Paso, uh, Ciudad Juarez. His father is Roberto Reci. He is the son of a Scottish immigrant uh, to Mexico. And his mother is Guadalupe Flores, born, born in Chihuahua. He was raised Mexican, Catholic, and his lapse Catholicism, of course, is very much a part of, of his writing. Um, um, he was raised in poverty and sometimes slept on a roll-out bed or on a pile of blankets you know, uh, in his home and everyone had a, another place or a couch or within that, that family. You know. uh, he recalls no very cold nights and very cold days, though, with the Texas wind that came through through the house in the projects in, in South Texas. Uh, he writes about uh, patching the windows with cardboard boxes that they took from the grocery stores to keep out the cold, the cold wind, you know, and that single one uh, furnace in the middle of the house that the children would huddle around, you know, in those, uh, days of the 30s, 40s, and into, into the 50s. Uh, Spanish was the language that he learned first in his, in his home. Um, he learned English like many of us in uh, school. And in kindergarten, like many of us do, his name was changed from Juan to John. So there we have John, John Reggie. You know, uh, his mother, as he says, never learned English. She always you know, maintained herself within, within Spanish and did not become a citizen until quite, quite late in life, life, life. He recalls being inspected uh, for lice in grade school, sent to special classrooms to learn the difference between shh 
Elche, which is right. home in Tresno, Spanish, no? And after graduating from Lamar High School in the early 1950s, he attended Texas College of Mines in Metallurgy, and he studied literature at that time. He had already written, handwritten, a novel as a young teenager, and that novel was titled Pablo. And Pablo was set in Yucatan and was based on a Mayan myth. So from very early on, uh, John Renchi understood some, his culture and wrote about, about his culture. Uh, uh, in, in college, he and another student decided they wanted to translate Bodas de Sangre by Federico Garcia Lorca. And so that was another task that he set himself to do because he didn't like the English translation and he, though in Spanish, decided he wanted to do that. So this gives you then a, a person uh, born in poverty, but that's not going to stop him from being the, the young intellectual as, a, as a, a teenager learning to write you know, and then going on, on to college. Uh, later he entered the service and then returned home to El Paso where he wrote his first stories, Mardi Gras, and Paso del Norte, and also City of Night. So this groundbreaking novel in American literature was written on a rented typewriter, because he didn't have a typewriter, in his mother's home, in the government projects of El Segundo Barrio in El Paso. This is the itinerary travel by others of Mexican and Mexican-American descent. And I say Mexican-American, or more appropriately, Mexican, because John Reggie was born and raised within Mexican culture. The proximity of Mexico is just there across the river. He had family that lived in Ciudad Juarez. In this border area, uh, Reggie enjoyed Mexican melodrama. These are the films of the golden age of Mexican uh, cinema, and he enjoyed him at the Mexican theater. And those of us who recall those times, he saw them at El Teatro Colón, at the Colón Theater in Southside, El Paso. That's where he saw these films. You know? He also went with his family to Mexican Variedades. We know about that too on the border. You know? He recalls Paco Villa, which was a, a well-known uh, magician at that time. Paco Miller was the one who discovered Tintan on the border. Mm -hmm. And then he acted you know, uh, in a play with the famous uh, Virginia Fabregas, uh, a Mexican actress, a legitimate stage actress. And he acted uh, in one of her plays as uh, a little baby Jesus, as he is fond of telling us about that. So, uh, you know, this is. Uh, Mexican popular culture, uh, what we know now in Mexico as Mexico Historico, Mexico Popular. This is what still defines Mexicans, even today in the 21st century. So this is uh, 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 John Reggie growing up, Mexicano then on, on the border. He knows the racism of light-skinned Mexicans against dark-skinned Mexicans. Coming from a mixed heritage, his family had different skin tones. One sister who was the darkest known within the family was called La India by the white or Spanish you know, people, uh, relatives on the south side of the border, so he, understand, he understands that, that too. Uh, in El Paso del Norte that I will, I will get to, and then also in his latest, his autobiography memoir of sorts, no? about my life and the kept woman, a memoir. He recalls those days of Jim Crow, uh, Texas, segregated schools, white supremacist, Texas, no, 1930s, 1940s. No. And he recalls that there were Mexican schools in the southern part of El Paso, the Mexican part, and close to the train tracks. And then there were the American schools on the north side of, of El Paso. But both in the home and the outside, John Ritchie was Mexican. And uh, this life, you know, this uh, Mexican, Mexican-American, is what we find in the first uh, stories uh, that became then books. 
I'm thinking about I know Celo Travo La Tierra by Tomar Rivera in 1971, or uh, Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo by Oscar Costa in 1972. So this is the road that was traveled by others you know, uh, after John Ritchie, but John Ritchie was there and would be there before them. Let me say now some things about El Paso del Norte, which is uh, to my uh, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's one of the beginnings, the multiple beginnings of Mexican American literature. And, and uh, uh, to this day, the themes that are there you know, in El Paso del Norte they continue in uh, City of Night and then continue in Mexican American literature through the 21st through the 21st century. So, uh, just let me say some um, things about uh, El Paso, El Paso del Norte. This is this autobiographical sketch essay by John Ritchie, and he terms his area the Mexican Southwest. And the term is important uh, at that time in the, 19, in the 1950s, because in the 1950s, say for example, upriver Rio Grande in Albuquerque, in Santa Fe, in Taos, no? uh, they didn't call this the Mexican Southwest, no? they called it the Spanish Southwest. And this was because of Charles C. Lewis, you know, who came from back east to Massachusetts, who named this territory, this area, which was conquered Mexico in some way, you know, named it uh, the Spanish Southwest. But for John Ritchie, you know, he called it the Mexican uh, Southwest, you know, where defending you know, his culture very early on you know, in, 19, in 1958. And this beautiful building, uh, Romanesque you know, in style, uh, uh, as you know, is uh, maybe not known, is built on a Mexican ranch. <coughs> this was at Rancho San Jose de Buenos Aires uh, back in the 19th century, bought by a Mr. Wolfskill, and all, all this no Wolfskill Drive that is close by. So it makes uh, perfect sense to me to honor uh, the most influential Mexican American writer of our time in UCLA and in Roy's Hall. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in El Rancho San Jose. Mm -hmm. Let me continue then. No? Um, um, border studies is what uh, Chicano literature, Mexican American literature, has given to the American literary landscape. Um, border studies is now an accepted field. You know, and, uh, 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 in a sense, throughout the world, the idea of borders are now part you know, of, everyday, of everyday life. And in some way, it's Mexican American and Chicano literature who gave that. To, to American literature. Uh, uh, two of the writers from the past century uh, uh, who were, in a sense, originators in border studies, Gloria and Saldúa, Borderlands La Frontera, the New Mestiza in 1987, and then Américo Paredes, in 1958, with his pistol in his hand, a border ballad and its hero. And these, uh, 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 this especially, uh, but it is, is considered the founder of Mexican-American studies or the founder of Mexican cultural studies, Mexican-American cultural studies. But we must think of El Paso del Norte about the border in 1958 and as also one of the important pieces of writing about this moment in time, 1958, and the beginning of Mexican-American literature. And I say this because, of course, there's another John Ritchie you know, David will tell us about. Him, and then there's another John Ritchie that John Densmore will tell us about. But this is, the, in a sense, the home culture, the origin of John Ritchie in 1958 in, uh, in Paso, El Paso del Norte. And he chose El Paso, El Paso del Norte, that name, because it's historically specific. It is the name that's given to this particular area since the 16th century, since 1598 and 1599. When La Nueva Mexico was conquered by Zacatecanos, uh, uh, then this was the beginning of El Paso, El Paso del Norte. It is part of Mexican literature too. Uh, Juan Rufo has a story, a short story titled El Paso del Norte. And we were playing the corrido, El Paso del Norte, as you were, as you were coming in. So John Ritchie chose that particular name for that uh, autobiographical essay. El Paso del Norte to give that that place, you no, know, uh, that has been known for centuries 
as part of Northern Mexican culture, or as he says in his sketch essay, the Mexican, the Mexican, the Mexican Southwest. So that's important. <clears throat> like others be, uh, after him, like uh, Paredes and Alzandu, uh, uh, John Reggie surveys you know, both sides of the border, through mestizaje, through Mexican Catholicism, through the mixtures of Spanish and indigenous uh, uh, roots, curanderos, Mexican Catholicism, uh, uh, Mexican melodrama with its Mexican mother love, as he, as he calls it. No? And then he also writes about personal and cultural identity, you know, poverty, racism, white supremacy, you know, and the forms of social and racial control at that time you know, in the 1950s. I'm saying all this because if we think of 1963, 1958, and what will happen, you no, know, uh, full-blown civil rights movement in 1963, I think we have to include John Reggie within those movements, though. Know, uh, of the late 50s, early, early 60s, 19, 1963. So John Ritchie will give us a catalog of racism that uh, uh, happens no one in El Paso. Uh, in a restaurant, uh, there's a sign that says, no, uh, we do not serve Mexicans, niggers, or dogs. That's one uh, of racism. In a movie theater, no, he's asked no, and told because of the skin tone, to sit on the right side because that is the side for white people, not to sit on the left side because that is the side for the Spics, you know, for Mexicans. And John Ritchie says, well, at that moment in time, I said, well, I don't want to stay in your lousy theater and walks, and walks out. You know, that's, that's John Ritchie. You know, as he says, you know, the hatred in much of Texas for Mexicans, it's fierce. They used to say, you know, Mexican greaser, Mexican greaser, when I went to a more grammar school. And I thought, well, yes, my mother uh, did an awful lot of frying, but we never put grease in our, in our frying. And so it bothered me. If God was Mexican, as my mother said, why did he allow this? Many of them Texans, no? really hate us, and he includes himself you know, as a Mexican, they really hate us pathologically, you know, like they hate Negroes in Arkansas. Also, Reggie also tells us of the Border Patrol, justice on the Rio Grande. I remember a, a dead bracero near the banks of the Rio Grande, face down, drowned in the shallow water. The water around him, red, red, red. Officially, he had drowned and was found, of course, by the Border Patrol. That's a border justice law that uh, Reggie knows for us. So here we have John Reggie, noting Mexicans, Mexican greasers, spics, the de Brasero, Negroes, and identifying with them, no, because he too has felt U.S. racism. No? And, and the hatred for Negroes in Arkansas, this is 1958, when this is published. And the hatred for Negroes <coughs> is a reference to 1957. Of course, this is the famous Little Rock Night. And everyone saw for the very first time on television and in headlines no, in those days, that those of us who remember and lived through that. No, the intense hatred no, for these nine students who are going to enter uh, uh, Little Rock no, uh, Central, Central High School. And uh, uh, the, intense, no, the intensity of the moment was so much that Eisenhower had to call the U.S. Army you know, to escort these students into, into that uh, high school. It's, a, it's a, an oblique reference you know, in this in Paso del Norte, but it's a reference to an important moment in American history. Uh, they hate Negroes you know, in Arkansas. They hate Mexicans in Texas. So to me, that's important to, to point that out about John Reggie and that his emerging uh, identity, you know, and that will later uh, be seen in the uh, 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 City of Night. You know? And then John Reggie also includes sexuality in this. And so this is his first essay about being Mexican. So he's 
written about uh, Mexicans and Spics and Greasers and Negroes. And then now he's going to write about sexuality. And so he says, and something quite, something twice. Once upon a time in El Paso, there was a band of fairies. Yes, really, in El Paso, Texas. And this city became a crossroads between the hot East Coast and the cool West Coast, fuzz-wise, vice-wise. And soon, San Jacinto Plaza, in the center of town, was a fairy paradise. The burls would camp there in that little park. The queens with the pinched-in waist, lisps, painted eyes, digging the soldiers for fortress. Alas, they went the way of all fairies. The inevitable cleanup, all in caps. The inevitable cleanup came, and the fuzz swooped on them, swooped on them, jealously, and to jail they went, all of them. In the city of night, and in this fiction after you know, 1963, John Ritchie will write about police brutality and incarceration of gay people. You know? And John Ritchie calls the fag queens and the fairies, you know? the foot soldiers on the front lines of change. Mm -hmm. Because they are the ones who get picked on, the ones who are beaten with those hate distorted faces you know, and gay bashings and also by the police. You know? So he calls these uh, uh, individuals noble stereotypes. You know? those people that we look at and we should understand that they have paid dearly for their freedom within, within the United States. Later on in the 70s, John Ritchie will write about what happens when you no longer want to take that from the police. So in a gay pride parade, David will pick up on that you know, of the 1970s and another uh, John Ritchie you know, at, at that time. But here then we have John Ritchie you know, of class and race and sexuality in his very first Mexican-American uh, uh, essay story, autobiography, telling us about all these individuals and the rights that they should have you know, within, within the United States. You know. uh, in one of the first literary anthologies of the Chicano movement, uh, Literatura Chicana, Texto y Contexto, 1972, uh, Ranchos del Paso del Norte was included in the section titled Los Barrios de Aslan. The Barrios de Aslan. By 1972, Reggie was already a well-known writer uh, from Los Angeles, and he had City at Night, Numbers, This Day's Death, Vampires. So he was a well-known writer. In the blue for this anthology is described you know, as a Chicano novelist and journalist from the south side of El Paso. But nothing is said of John Ritchie's uh, identity or sexuality. You know. uh, the text was almost exactly as El Paso del Norte, with one difference, that the section on the ferries was not included. So here then we have you know, in, uh, the first, one of the first anthologies in which John Ritchie is included that there, there are no fairies in the barrios of Asla. Mm -hmm. And there was censorship no, on the part no, of that, that anthology. And one of the editors was gay. But in that time, uh, gay and lesbian identities were not part of the movement. No. So uh, John Ratchet, uh, in that early moment in time, received censorship no, for that that, only that uh, piece, you know, in the Paso de Norte, where he writes about sexuality and you know, uh, the lack of freedom you know, for U.S. individuals you know, uh, and, uh, in the park, you know, in San Jacinto, San Jacinto Park. So that is, is John Ranchi thinking of the ways, you know, that this first uh, autobiographical essay sets up, you know, what will come afterwards. It's an overlooked essay. Not many people refer to it, not many people uh, read it, no? but it is there from the very beginning, beginning of who, it, who John Ritchie is in terms of recalling the Mexican Southwest of the past, no? the present of Mexican immigration uh, into, into the United States, the presence no, in that 1950s moment of the emergent civil rights movement of 58 and then later on in 19. 
1963, and then also with this particular section, the, the eventual uh, uh, foregrounding of uh, sexuality in, in his writings, you know, and then coming uh, into 1963 and, and the City of Mind. I want to say that uh, John Ritchie does not abandon it, Bossy. He does not abandon uh, his Mexican Catholicism. All that, too, is a part of city of light. It's there at the very beginning, and Paso is there. And it's also there at the end. City of night is framed by his Mexicanness, you know, by, his, by his culture. And it ends, uh, as we all know, on Shrove Tuesday, and also on Ash Wednesday, you know, when uh, the character, who is clearly Mexican-American, decides to go back to El Paso. Now, the narrative of City of Night is, uh, in a sense, an escape from a home in which there was abuse and violence. So we have that you know, of a young man trying to find himself, trying to save himself. But then the writing of, of City of Night is a liberation, an understanding and a liberation at that moment in time of these individuals within uh, the book. Thinking of 1963, this is a multiracial novel. There are African American characters. There's a diversity of sexual identities and personal identities within the book. And the book then is written from the margins by a Mexican American with a Mexican American with a Mexican American character. So it's important to me to point out that uh, about City a uh, City of Night. In the new edition, the fiftieth edition, is a letter by James Baldwin, you know, who wrote to Grove Press after reading the manuscript of, of, of City of Life. James Wildman also understood John Reggie. John Reggie had his cities of night, and James Baldwin had his cities of destruction. They were both in some way you know, ghettos within the American landscape. And so I'll just end with uh, James Baldwin saying, he reminds us of what we, of what we do not know and even more perhaps of what we do not want to know. And this is the most humbling and liberating experience. So I thank John Ritchie for all his work. So I went through, and I've written a, a, about John um, a few times in the past, and um, so I've cobbled together a sort of presentation based on that, and I'm also going to read um, read some of his work as well. I um, edited this anthology of LA literature about a decade or so ago, writing Los Angeles, um, and I included uh, the, the, the chapter on the gay parade from The Sexual Outlaw, which is, um, to me, one of the most resonant pieces um, of his work. And I'm going to read a couple of passages from that, but I want to preface that by saying um, I also just want to sort of double down on what Hector said. I, I do think this is work very fundamentally about breaking down barriers. And you can tell because it's impossible to categorize John. He's all of these writers, and they all are facets of one writer. Um, and I think that's something that's really kind of remarkable and also not remarkable because we all contain um, those kind of facets and multitudes. Often we live in a culture that likes to categorize us. And I think one of the sort of most lasting legacies of John's career is a kind of refusal to be categorized. Um, I discovered him because of uh, Grove Press and the Evergreen Review. Um, I expected him to be a sort of um, Kerouac-style writer. I was very, I have a lot of admiration for Kerouac also, but I was very surprised, pleasantly so, to discover that um, he was not. And it opened up a whole other way of thinking about um, 
about literature and what literature could do. And what has interested me about, um, what interests me a lot about his writing is that I do consider it in many ways to be sort of the literature of liberation on all sorts of levels. And I think that it speaks to us about what effect literature and art can have on, uh, on, on social polity or on us as social beings in terms of changing the way we, we, um, we think about, uh, have the way culture thinks about things. Culture is resistant to change. Culture is resistant to the point of view of the other, whatever that means, generally the other, you know, anyone other than ourselves. But what literature and what art, but what literature as narrative art <coughs> fundamentally does is to pr provoke empathy. And I do think it provokes empathy. Um, I, I mean, I think that word provoke is, is apropos. Sometimes we want to empathize, sometimes we don't. It's very difficult to read um, narrative character driven literature that is honest and um, well developed without cre without some sort of empathy for uh, the human nature of the characters, the human struggle of the stories to be created. And that is, I think, the, a fundamental aspect of literature and a fundamental aspect of, of John's writing. Um, I thought about him recently, this summer, actually, when, uh, when the DOMA decision came down. Um, and so I'm going to read a little piece I wrote then as a preface to sort of the material from the sexual outlaw, and then hopefully I'm going to make a smooth segue into a broader discussion of sort of City of Night and John's legacy. We'll see how smooth that, that goes. But, um, but the first thing I thought, you know, writing for the paper, um, you know, I get asked to sort of comment on things. We're always sort of looking for um, angles. And, um, and often it can be a jerry rig process, but when the DOMA decision came out, I immediately called uh, my editor and said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about John Reshi this morning, and you know, can I write something about this? The first thing I thought of was, was that, um, with the first line of this piece, which, piece, which is John Reshi should be proud. Um, it was his novel, City of Night, the novel of gay life that took place in part in downtown Los Angeles that helped carve out a place for gay writing in American literature. And yet when I heard that the Supreme Court had overturned a key provision of the Defense of Marriage Act, as well as sending Proposition 8 back to Federal District Court in California, I help remembering another piece of Reshi's writing, the nonfiction book, The Sexual Outlaw, which includes a vivid account of a 1976 Hollywood gay pride parade. Reshi has always defined himself as an outsider, whether as a gay man in a straight-dominated society or as an outlier in gay culture itself. I would not march in the parade, he tells us. I wanted an overview, wanted to move, listen, see, absorb it all, and besides, I don't really like joining anything. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Writers shouldn't join things. Um, at the same time, Reshi can't help but marvel that the parade is taking place at all in a city where even 10 years ago, this is 1976, so even in 1966, a cop might bust you for holding same gender hands in public. It all still seemed too far out for many, hadn't the dinosauric Los Angeles Herald Examiner lamented editorially the week before that so horrendous a time had arrived as would permit, on Independence Day, a parade of perverts? <laughs> parade of perverts. That such a phrase could once appear on the editorial page of a major metropolitan daily is a reminder of just how far we've come but also how far we have to go. And I should parenthetically say here that one of the other reasons I wrote this piece is that um, I have a 19-year-old son who's gay, who was very delighted by this decision, um, but who I've been sort of handing him books like City of Night and other things to say, you know, this is the history you need to be aware of because there were time, you know, there was a time when phrases like parade of perverts appeared on the op-ed page of major metropolitan daily newspapers. Reshi makes the point explicit by claiming Hollywood Boulevard is something of an open territory, as if in doing so he could actually, as if in doing that he could actually make it so. This, of course, is the first lesson of liberation politics. Take charge of the future by reframing the present, defining it on your own terms. I think of Abby Hoffman, who once declared, the ground you are standing on is a liberated zone, defend it. Or anarchist visionary Hakeem Bey in his temporary autonomous zone, a little piece of free space we carry around with us always. I also think of Václav Havel, who back in the bad old days of the Iron Curtain posited what he called a second culture in which to live as if one were free, paradoxically made one free, because it unlocked the shackles of the mind. This is what Reshi is suggesting also as he acknowledges when he writes about the itchy sentiment that signals real pride. He goes on, here you are, and here they are, 
and here we are. I remember Ma Joad's proud speech of the Okies eventual triumph and defeat. We keep coming, she said, because we're the people. So um, the, the two passages from, um, from the gay parade section of the sexual outlaw that I think really most speak to that, one is this sort of claiming, the, the, the long paragraph that kind of claims Hollywood Boulevard as, uh, as a temporary autonomous zone. And that idea, which is an idea very much like, just means that you, uh, whatever space you're in, you define. So if I, so, uh, you know, so this little, my, my, my personal physical space, all of our personal physical space is uh, a temporary autonomous zone. We are the only people who have control over that space. And so Hollywood Boulevard becomes that in the course of this, um, in the course of this parade for a kind of nascent gay community. Uh, of course the parade would be down Hollywood Boulevard. Where else but on the turf they've tried deviously with ordinances, openly with violence, to wrest from us year after year. Hollywood Boulevard, site of how many gay battles fought cruising and hustling, being chased away by the envious cops, and returning to cruise and hustle on the same corner, your favorite. Our street conquered with how many busts for loitering and soliciting and trespassing. How many charges of lewd conduct, how many citations for even jaywalking? Bought with how many cop interrogations and trips to jail to be hassled, questioned, booked, held, charged? Oh yes, bought and paid for, yes, in symbolic lavender bloodbaths, this beautiful, ugly street with its butch army surplus store for workers' boots and muscle shirts, dandy shops for glitter concerts and times when you want to show your super trim build, the store displaying the ubiquitous statue of David in two groin sizes, <laughs> this street with its cartoon vamp style shop featuring superb sequined clothes, just right for a drag ball, this boulevard with its outdoor food stands ingeniously right for loitering, cruising, soliciting, hustling, jaywalking to, and lewd conduct. Yes, we had fought dedicatedly and sometimes bitterly for this royal street, and now it was more symbolically ours than any other place in the world. And if they dig a cavern to replace it, we will cruise in it. <laughs> All right. So that you know, there you. I, I think that, and I think that idea of sort of thinking about the symbolic value and then making the symbolic value actual value is really is really key to that. And then at the end of the um, at the end of the essay, the cops move in as Rushi has sort of known that they would. And what then what happens is really quite remarkable. Um, so I'm going to just read you this as well. Hands tightening on their sticks, the cops tense perceptibly forward. What was happening? Weren't they the cops? And L.A. cops to boot. Nothing in their cop training, no, nothing in their lives had prepared them for this. Gay men and women, not afraid of them. Imagine. Gay men and women, and even an obviously straight woman, taunting them. Not only that, but questioning their masculinity. And it hurt. Oh, it hurt. After all, how clearly, how much more clearly could they prove their masculinity? Hadn't they bashed the skulls of queers who resisted arrest, and even of those who didn't? How many handcuffs had they clicked smartly in raids on queer bars? And if the guy, the guy, excuse me, and if the guy you said was groping the other guy wasn't really the right one, so what? He probably groped or got groped yesterday. So nothing during those days of barracks intimacy, good days, buddy days, nothing in police academy had prepared them for this. Not the showers, the recreation periods, the sweaty teens. Certainly nothing during the inspections by the chief of police, eyeing them from head to foot slowly, for flaws in their uniform, of course. Nothing had prepared them for this. Jesus, God, they were the cops, and those were the queers. Why then did it feel as if they, what the fuck was happening here? <laughs> so they held their billy clubs. And that too, I think, again, a really remarkable moment. I also want to point out that the, one of the most interesting things is that for all the disdain for the police, there's also empathy for the police. And the first act of empathy that I think literature provokes is the writer's empathy for the other in their landscape. That's what allows us, that's what allows the text to become open and allows us to emerge. Empathy is a two-way street. And I think that even here, um, the empathy for the police as individuals, for their confusion, for their feeling of um, displacement in a certain way, opens up what we hope is becomes their empathy, um, empathy for everyone else. 
So um, what I'm going to slide—I want to slide into talking a little bit about City of Night and, and John's entire career. I, you know, I've had the pleasure of in interviewing him a number of times over the years, and I interviewed him um, for a piece about 15 years ago, largely about City of Night after he won um, Penn uh, USA's Lifetime Achievement Award. And um, so this is going to provide the embarrassing experience for John of hearing himself quoted back to himself. I hope, that, I hope the quotes are accurate. Um, I believe that they are. Um, anyway, so this is more of a kind of overview, and I feel like it sort of, you know, th this will be the, this is the, the kind of background. Um, as I said, as I was sort of going through material and thinking about what to present, I thought about excerpting from this, but the more I read it, the more I thought it actually sort of stands as a sort of statement on its own. So, um, and it goes back to the very beginning and then, and then moves forward. For John Reshi, the road to respectability has been a long and twisted one, but in the end, it's meant a vindication. Fifty years ago, after all, following the publication of his first novel, City of Night, he was vilified as an exhibitionist and a phony, run up the flagpole of critical contempt. Sodom on five dollars a day, screamed a village voice headline, while the New Republic called its review City of Dreadful Night. Worst of all was the New York Review of Books, where in a piece with the shameful title Fruit Salad, Alfred Chester conjectured that Ratchie did not even exist. Half a lifetime and a continent away from the controversy, Reshi remembers everything with an immediacy that bespeaks a kind of savage grace. I should say this was a great role model lesson for me because I also remember everything like this too. It's important to remember what people say about you right now. Um, my life was so insulting to some people, he says simply, that they wished it away. He can still cite the handful of sentences with which the New Yorker dismissed his novel, and he spent more than 30 years battling the New York Review for a retraction especially after Chester's essay was included, in, was included in, a, in an anthology of the magazine's finest work. A letter Reshi wrote uh, to the magazine was finally published in the 1990s. <clears throat> Compounding the situation was the fact that in the months after City of Night first appeared, Reshi disappeared from New York and its fishbowl literary scene, choosing to travel to the Caribbean and Texas instead. I saw hints of how my life could just be uprooted, he notes, and I didn't want to give it up. One consequence was the appearance at various events of imposters masquerading as Reshi, which only fueled speculation that City of Night was actually the work of someone like James Baldwin or Tennessee Williams writing under a pseudonym. What's particularly galling is that City of Night was very much Reshi's story, a novel about the underworld of street hustlers that along with the work of Allen Ginsberg, William S. Burroughs, and Jean Genet played an essential role in the development of gay writing and its emergence as a vibrant strand of literary life. Without Reshi, writers like Edmund White, Paul Manette, and Dennis Cooper, to name just a couple, would still be marginalized, their books persecuted, and their points of view dismissed. Interestingly, however, Reshi never intended to write about his life. City of Night began as a letter describing his experiences in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. It was published in 1958 in Evergreen Review. I swear to God, Ratchie says, it sounds like one of those literary stories, but I had no intention about writing the world I was writing about the world I was in. But when Don Allen wrote Accepting Mardi Gras for the Evergreen Review, he asked if it was part of a novel, and I thought, if it helps to tell them that, I will. <laughs> and I went back to Los Angeles, back to that life, and writing the novel took four years. It's ironic that City of Night should have come into being through such a serendipitous process, for Retchy is anything but an accidental writer. He still bristles at Terry Southern's description of him in those terms. Born in El Paso to a Mexican mother and a Scottish father, he discovered literature as a child, beginning his first novel about Marie Antoinette at the age of eight. From there, he went on to other literary projects, including an expose of high school and a narrative describing a revolution in heaven in which all the angels turned against God. Um, I also drew, he recalls, and I was a professional child actor, but writing was always primary. I wrote secretly a lot. It was a kind of private life. Although City of Night, as well as books like Numbers and the Sexual Outlaw, have placed Reshi firmly within the gay literary tradition, his interests and intentions are far more complex. He has written fiction dealing with Marilyn Monroe, and the Mexican-American experience in Los Angeles. And uh, in Our Lady of Babylon, he traces the lives of several so-called fallen women through history, including Mary Magdalene, Salome, and Eve. I'm very attentive to structure, he says, and I work in a variety of forms. If there's anything his books have in common, it's the experience of the dispossessed and the question of identity, although those themes have continually developed and grown. An essential part of that process is his work as a teacher of creative writing. 
in which he is, was engaged for much of his life, been engaged for much of his life. Teaching, in fact, is one of the things that brought him to Los Angeles for good in the early 1970s, and the loyalty he has inspired in his students is both legendary and heartfelt. I'm, I'm sure some of them, some of you are here. Um, the irony is that he never intended to be a teacher, like so many other things, it was simply a matter of being in the right place at the right time. Over the years, however, it has become a major aspect of his engagement with literature, allowing him to help nurture a younger generation of writers, while emphasizing the significance of elements like image and structure in the creation of a successful work. And I think this is also key, this sort of commitment to community and this idea of bringing along younger writers. Um, that's an essential thing. Of course, Reshi acknowledges it's something of a contradiction to have come from the streets only to enter the academy, but at the same time, the two worlds are not as far apart as one might think. Early in his teaching career, he was so broke that he had to start hustling in Hollywood again. I was out on Selma, he laughs, and some extraordinary things happened. One night at about 3 a.m., a car pulled up and someone said, good evening, Professor Reshi. <laughs> <laughs> out for an evening stroll. There I was with no shirt and oil on my chest. It was like my two lives had become one. <laughs> Ultimately, such a scene may be emblematic of Reshi's life and career, for he has always steadfastly resisted being categorized. Today, he once pointed out, I find myself a Texas writer left out of discussions of Texas writers, a Chicano writer omitted from anthologies of Chicano writers, a California writer ignored in books about California, and even though I'm excluded from several anthologies of homosexual writers, I am often designated as a gay writer. Uh, Carolyn C. once um, took note of this, but saw beyond it to a deeper connection, um, describing what she called a marvelous integration in a most fundamental sense. Reshi, she explained, may be an outlaw, but by being a teacher, an uncle, a dad, a godfather to his students, he has almost turned into an in-law. The one, <laughs> the one in the family you turn to when everything and everyone in your life has failed. <coughs> C's image is compelling, not least, because it suggests a manner in which all of Reshi's complexities fall into place. For his part, Reshi seems to agree. Caught in today's unfriendly atmosphere, he has written, some fine emerging writers have begun to ask, why write? That old pessimist Jeremiah may have inadvertently inspired an answer when he wrote, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? It is the writer who continues to try and know the hidden heart. Stop writing. Think of the lives left buried if you don't explore them. And yes, the cruelty is left unexposed. Thank you. First of all, let me say it's, a, it's an honor to be here, sitting next to this man. Uh, it's an honor. So I am a native Angelino, as my mother was. She rode the red car. And um, so, and this guy's done a lot on LA. So, like David, I know this town. And John's description of it throughout his books is thrilling. Just been in a town about an hour ago. Dun, 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 dun. Take a look around, see which way the wind blows. Dun, 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 dun. Met a little girl in the Hollywood bungalow. Are you a lucky little lady in a city of lights or just another lost angel? City of night, city of night, city of night. Ashen lady, get up your vows. Ashen lady, give up your vows. Save our city right now. LA, See why I'm the drummer? <laughs> John's work. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> so, in 1965, I walked into Ray Manzarek's apartment in Venice, California, the great late Ray Manzarek, our keyboard player. And uh, Jim was, Morrison was staying with Ray. And I saw on the floor, a copy of 
City at Night, mm. along with uh, other books and LPs. And I picked it up, and uh, both Ray and Jim said it was great. But back then, I wasn't much of a reader. I was voracious for music. Um, I got my fake ID in Tijuana and uh, <laughs> played in clubs and, uh, and saw John Coltrane many times at Shelley's Man Hall. And, um, I had read a few books. I don't know, Siddhartha. Uh, uh, yeah, 60s. Yeah, <laughs> 60s, right. Um, so I was looking at City at Night and I realized that it was about LA street life and hustlers and stuff like that. And I put the book back down. One is a product of one's time. And back then, the word gay was only about being happy. <laughs> there was a much more derogatory word that described the scene that started with an F. So it's hard to admit, but I would say back then, I was homophobic. Now, we're going to cut to the 80s, early 80s, is Hollywood. Cut to <laughs> <laughs> And a dear friend of mine is uh, helping me with my first writing project. Uh, I'm, uh, and he's directing me in a one-act play I'm doing. And jump and I didn't know, jump-starting, uh, my, uh, the beginning of my long, winding road to learn how to write. His boyfriend, his boyfriend's gorgeous painting is hanging in my foyer. <coughs> so I write an autobiography, Riders on the Storm, um, which gets respectable reviews in the New York Times and Washington Post. Um, I had given the galleys to Oliver Stone before it was published <coughs> in exchange for a thank you when his movie on the doors came out. And uh, when that happened, my book went on the New York Times list in one week. Wow, power of media. But I was still insecure about uh, calling myself a writer. Uh, I, I wrote a novel that still needs work and, and many, many articles in uh, various magazines and newspapers, LA Times, Nation, London Guardian, Rolling Stone. And then I wrote a second memoir. I, I not only have one, I have two self-centered memoirs. <laughs> and um, then I started feeling like, okay, I have another avenue of creativity. I'm a writer, and I'm obsessed with words, and I am in awe over John's beautiful prose and his fearless teaching of culture and religion and writing. John and I have much in common. Soy Juan. <laughs> <laughs> Early reviews of City of Night were awful describing it with cruelty as a deadly prose. And Pete Johnson from the LA Times described The Doors, the new house band at the Whiskey A Go Go, as four guys who had no direction. The guitar player wandered around aimlessly, the uh, organ player read mysteries from the keys, the singer sings with his eyes closed. <laughs> you imagine? And the drummer seems lost in his own world. <laughs> So, uh, Jim not only copped the leather look from Juan, uh, he lifted a couple lines, city at night, city at night. He changed it to at, city at night, city at night. And just another lost angel, is that, that's you too, isn't it? So we owe him royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, you steal from the best. <laughs> uh, Light My Fire and City of Night 
it became huge, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> Light My Fire was number one for 26 weeks, and I know John is frustrated by the fact that he has written many, many great books besides City of Night, uh, which people aren't that aware of. So, in that spirit, I just finished The Miraculous Day of Amelia Gomez. Yeah. Oh. And it fed me so much hidden information about why I'm a renegade Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> At my first confession, I was so scared I made up lies that I stole money from my dad so I'd have something to confess. <laughs> <laughs> and Amelia felt no reason to mention in that dark box with the shadow of a priest behind the grid that she had been divorced nor the men she had slept with. <laughs> <laughs> <Happy John. laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Amelia's son committed suicide, as in real life my brother did. And like Amelia, my mother got through it with unwavering faith in the Virgin. I used to um, feel jealous of my mother's security that she got from religion, but I'm of a different time. I found that LSD made quite a bigger difference than the stale communion way for a church. <laughs> So like Amelia, I rebelled against the church. In a rage, she dumped vials of holy water into the toilet, and I deliberately took communion without confession, thinking that I wasn't born in sin. Cancel my subscription to the resurrection, send my credentials to the house of detention. I've got some friends inside. Morris. <laughs> so, like Amelia, my mother has always prayed for me. Uh, in the 60s, I got into Eastern meditation and was given a Sanskrit mantra by Maharishi to chant over and over, which I still do. But after a while, I thought, sounds kind of just like my mom saying the rosary. <laughs> um, I've hung out with the mariachis at the plaza in Boyle Heights, and I vividly remember the Chicano Auditorium, so I want to thank you, John, uh, for keeping these important events and landmarks alive. And to close, I'm going to read for five or ten minutes from Amelia Gomez, because it completely captures my relationship with my girlfriend of many years. Like Amelia, my girlfriend and I both had difficult relationships before we met, not to mention being uh, riddled with sin and guilt over sex. So even though John is writing about a one-nighter that Amelia has, which turns sour because she finds out that she's with the coyote, uh, the description is miraculous. Now, can I see it? That's the question. Excuse these weird glasses, it helps me see it. <laughs> and maybe a flashlight. <laughs> he was admiring her the way a young man admires a young woman he is thinking of falling in love with will romance a decent interval Mary. There was no doubt he had mistaken her for a woman much younger than she was, perhaps his age. It wasn't that she wanted to look younger, no. It was just that she wanted to recapture, no. You couldn't recapture what had never existed. It was just that she wanted to think she might experience perhaps only a hint of what she had been denied, what it would have been like to be a young girl loved, and yes, desired. It was that feeling of a denied beginning 
lost before it could be hoped for and kept her there. John, I'm editing, I hope you're alive. Jumping. His eyes had been on her last night in his room, as if to be granted permission to do what he did. Did she not? Perhaps only slightly. He bent to kiss her mouth. She closed her lips to render the kiss innocent, as it must be. Then he did this, so softly, so soundlessly, that she was not jarred nor frightened. He closed the door that had remained open. He stood before her then, and slowly, very slowly, yes, ready to stop if she forbade it, he drew the dress from her shoulders and kissed them gently. Yes, and she let him, because, because, because he had done it with such caring and tenderness the way it had never been done before, not clumsily, not angrily, no, but the way it must be, the way he was now removing her dress, her clothes, so lovingly, the way it should be, the way it should have been, the way it would be now. And then she realized he had removed his own clothes, realized it only when she glimpsed his body. Briefly, because she had never seen a man look so naked. So, yes, she had felt embarrassment, wanted to cover herself, but that was natural, clean embarrassment. He stared at her breasts as if in awe, studied them so closely that she felt his eyelashes brush her nipples. Oh, was it possible this was a first time for him? And it felt as if it were for her as if she were returning to a time that had gone wrong, was being righted now, cleansed, clean of desire. <clears throat> she had lain back in his bed last night, and he leaned over her, his head just slightly bowed, bowed, as if honoring her initiation into clean desire, she had thought. Then, with his hands, he touched her body slowly, all of it, desiring it, not assaulting it, touching every part of it, lingeringly, as if he wanted to ensure if she was feeling all the wondrous sensations, sensations which had been killed by Salvador and had remained dead with the others, bringing her body back to life. In the muted light, he left on, Quote, so I can see all of you, pretty Amelia, end quote. She saw her body as if for the first time, saw her breasts lush, yes, hued a deeper brown in this light, the nipples just darker, saw her hips, sensual in their fullness, allowed herself to see the abrupt velvet darkness between her thighs, which extended the sinuous line of her hips, all of this, and his body, beautiful, too, taut, just lightly brushed with a film of hair, was right in its nudity, not dirty for abuse, but clean for desire and love. She had felt his hands lightly on her breasts. He didn't crush them, didn't squeeze them. He cut them as if they were precious. And they were, the way a girl's full breasts are precious and beautiful. S sweet, sweet, he sighed. Her body quivered, a warm quivering that spread. This was how it was supposed to feel. She knew now, this was, that she knew now, with this man, this young man, this angel, that was his name, who, still wore his holy amulet about his neck. She was aware of a new excitement, the excitement of the first exploration, an excitement that should have occurred before rape and accusations and anger and deaths. She glanced to one side to a chair. She imagined that white veil that had swirled in a breeze rested there.
fictional characters. I'm a sound guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that okay. There you go. Okay, fine. There you go. From where do a writer's characters come? Who are they finally? These wily, shifty creatures darting in and out of trouble. Creatures who cajole, flirt with their author, seduce him, at times challenge him to the point that they run away beyond their creator's intent. Don Quixote fought his most formidable battle, not with windmills, but with Cervantes. <laughs> who detested him, ridiculed him, <laughs> tortured him, dismissed him. And who won in that epic battle between the author and his character? Don Quixote did. <laughs> By evolving into myth, becoming beyond Cervantes' intentions, a figure of pathos, a noble hero in search of the impossible dream. And he is that, even for those who do not know who Cervantes is. Still, it was Cervantes who imbued him with the characteristics that allowed his character to triumph. Christopher Isherwood gave me sage advice on using real people in one's writing. You can question their morals, call them liars, expose them as thieves, as long as you describe them as attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Several instances in my life have tested that admonition. In my first novel, City of Night, I described a male nurse I knew as a deceiver, entirely unethical, prone to collect credit cards from dead patients. I received an angry letter from him in which he asked, do I really strike you as being coldly blonde? <laughs> in a short story that would become a part of that same novel, I wrote about a downtown Los Angeles queen who called herself Miss Destiny and dreamt of one day having a white wedding. Titled The Fabulous Wedding of Miss Destiny, that story appeared in a small literary journal called Big Table. I thought no one would read it. As I strolled one afternoon along Hollywood Boulevard, I heard a voice calling. Jarechi, Jarechi. For the longest time, I preferred to be anonymous, like others in the world of the streets that I was living with, a world hidden to all but those who existed in it. So I was startled to hear my full name called. There, Jay walking toward me, impervious to protesting honks, came Miss Destiny. <laughs> My dear, she trilled, I want to thank you for making me even more famous. <laughs> In truth, I had made her grander than she was. At times, one has to veer away from reality in order to bring fiction to life. I had augmented the real Miss Destiny's effervescent stories to give them resonance and, I hoped, more wishful poetry. Subsequently, she absorbed the characteristics of my character. She told her stories with my embellishments. She claimed they were her exact words. <laughs> she landed on the cover of one magazine in full wedding drag. <laughs> demurely, and she gave a nasty, untrue interview about me. But I forgave her because she described me as being cute. <laughs> <laughs> For years she called me late at night, and in a boozy voice she would ask me to verify to whomever she was with 
that she was indeed the fabulous Miss Destiny, <laughs> I always happily obliged. <laughs> I once quite literally became a character from one of my own books. My second novel, Numbers, was set mainly in Griffith Park. Its protagonist is a young man named Johnny Rio, who, th who spends his idle time seeking adventures in the park. I was idling in the same park one afternoon, still anonymous, when a stranger braked his car to tell me that someone had written a book about me. <coughs> who, I asked, befuddled, his name is John Ritchie, he said. <laughs> but I don't think that's his real name. <laughs> Nobody would write a book like that under his own name. <laughs> As he left, he called back. Goodbye, Johnny Rio. <laughs> the sternest test of issue, issue was admonition about permission to describe uh, real persons even as morally decadent as long as they're described as attractive <laughs> occurred when I modeled a character after him. Without using his actual name, I described him in my novel numbers as somewhat randy in his cups, pardon the appropriately dated euphemism. I avoided saying that he was quite bitchy. <laughs> <laughs> And I described him as an attractive middle-aged man, to the point that the painter Cadmus, recognizing him, said I had been too kind. <laughs> the purveyor of the advice I had followed was outraged. An invitation made earlier to dinner at his home was withdrawn with an angry telegram from his longtime companion on behalf of both of them. Although I had described his companion as being pretty, <laughs> one might be tempted to claim that some characters are divinely inspired. I was sunbathing one summer day when, looking up, I saw two long clouds sailing toward each other to form a cross. What, I wondered, would some of the Mexican Catholic women I had known in El Paso when we lived in the government projects, make of that. Mm -hmm. I rushed home to write a short story about a woman who interprets the configuration as the first, the first portent of a possible miracle, all that can save her at a time of crisis. Inspired, I finished a rough draft in a few hours. When my partner, Michael, now, my mate, and sitting there, uh, came home. I read him the story. You've got to write a whole novel about her, he exhorted me. I started The Miraculous Day of Amalia Gomez. Soon, I encountered problems. The woman's antecedents were many. The Mexican women who were our neighbors and who daily sought my mother's counsel. But I was creating a unique person, not an allegorical figure. I marvel at the fact that destiny exists only in retrospect, when a series of coincidences string together into inevitability. On such a fateful day, I had gone to a thrifty drugstore to buy a, a beach chair. The store was out of those chairs. A clerk recommended another store. I drove out of my way to that other store. I should have heard destiny spinning about me. I walked in and halted in awe of one of the most gorgeous creations I have ever seen. She was a Mexican-American woman, not yet 40. She had luscious black hair, waves and waves and waves of it. And into those luminous cascades, she had placed a fresh rose, red against the black of her hair. 
she was a few pounds heavier than she might claim to be. <laughs> the word lush occurred to me. <coughs> she was dressed in a fashion beyond fashion, entirely her own. In a gesture of decorum, she had added to her red blouse a lacy ruffle that, however, did not compromise the splendid fullness of her breasts. It occurred to me then that rather than having tried for decorum, she had actually called more attention to her ample endowment with the enamored ruffle. A dark skirt embraced her curvy thighs and it opened in winking slits at her legs. All this exorbitance was displayed upon sling pumps. There was my flesh and blood, Amalia. I followed her along the aisles. <laughs> Noticing me, she added to her stride a swing of her hips. <laughs> I pursued her until in another aisle, a Mexican man with an aggressive mustache. <laughs> <laughs> and he was shorter than I am glad to tell you. <laughs> Blocked my path. Boss, he challenged me. Well, nothing, I retreated. The woman looked thrilled, as if she might welcome a good fight. <laughs> and yet, and this in retrospect, was what had held me spellbound. There was something yearning, something touchingly defiant about her bold presentation. It was to her that I would donate the enigma of the intersecting clouds. No other character of mine has taken over her life as did Amalia. Because I came to love her and imbued her with many of my beloved sister Olga's sauciness, I winced when she refused to eat danger signals that I thrust at her. A woman on the brink of dangerous revelations, disastrous revelations, she continued to court even more disaster. Stop, Amalia, I wanted to scream. She plunged ahead stubbornly, determined to triumph or surrender in defeat. Which it would be, I left up to her. I discovered this over and over about fictive characters. For them to live fully, one must allow them to be true to themselves. The traits, the characteristics, the contradictions, the background one gives them. One mustn't interfere once that creation springs to life. I tell my writing students, Pursue your characters relentlessly. Corner them. Don't let them get away with anything. I add, in life, be kind. In your art, be ruthless. There are times when one has to change real life protagonists into exaggerations to see them clearly, create a close up of their souls. I spent a summer once as the guest of a fascinating man on his private island. With him was his 13-year-old son, already a near replica of his cunning father. During my visit, the man's exotic mistress was staying with us. Then his famous first wife came and stayed. And then his second wife, an heiress, <laughs> might come. What to make of this cauldron of conflict stirred? <laughs> what to make of the sinister boy who threatened to drown me in the lake? <laughs> I converted them all into actual vampires <laughs> and titled my next book, The Vampires. I made the motley crew decadent, degenerate, and evil and gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> On Venice Beach one, yeah, one afternoon, along the boardwalk, a youngish man in jockey shorts and cowboy boots was performing there, 
dancing and singing and playing the guitar. Nearby, a pretty girl with him looked at him sadly, while passers-by giggled and nudged each other and heckled him, even while dropping money in his hat. What had driven him to that public exhibition? I subsequently found out that the same man went on to become notorious as the naked cowboy, a brazen figure courting derision, dancing almost naked in Times Square, even in snowy winter. I didn't like the actual life revealed of the man who had moved me on the beach, so I gave him another life. In my novel, The Life and Adventures of Lyle Clemens, which I modeled after Fielding's Tom Jones, I took him off the beach and left him in front of the Egyptian theater, <laughs> attempting to add grandeur to his performance. There, he still sang and danced in boots and jockeys, but now to expiate a painful humiliation in his mother's life. I was able to stop the heckling and derision by having him plaintively sing his mother's favorite song, Amazing Grace. And I even flooded the street in radiant sunshine, sweeping along Hollywood Boulevard. There are those who might consider less noble some reason for casting <coughs> real people as characters. When a critic has been personally and gratuitously nasty about me, while ostensibly reviewing one of my books, and there have been those as difficult as it might seem to. <laughs> Okay, uh, she or he is then reserved a place in every novel I write. <laughs> <laughs> Assigned a minor role, <laughs> often with their almost actual names. <laughs> a shrill reviewer in the New York Times has become a mud wrestling entrepreneur. <laughs> Another, a babbling, inebriated, rhyming weatherman. In the life and adventures of Lyle Clemens, I extended that honor to make a political statement during the time of the book. Clarence Thomas became a petty loan shark. <laughs> Antonin Scalia, a vulgar exploiter of young star map sellers. <laughs> Discretion cautions me to tell you what Sandra May Day O'Connor did on the set of the pornographic movie <laughs> produced by the company owned by Mr. and Mrs. Rehnquist, <laughs> citizen of Encino. <laughs> I justify this practice by pointing out that I am in the grand tradition of Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, Samuel Butler, Walt Whitman, Anthony Burgess, and dozens of others. In a recent novel, The Coming of the Night, I included a character closely modeled after a famous male porn performer whose family cruelly rejected him. After he died, the opportunistic family sued the producers of his movies. My publisher, Grove Press, and myself for besmirching the notorious man's reputation. I had not even known him, did not use his real name, wrote sympathetically about him, and I even disguised him by changing a famous tattoo of a kangaroo on his left buttock <laughs> to that of a rabbit on his right button. <laughs> <laughs> the matter was dismissed as an excuse. At times, real people turned themselves into fictive characters. Along Melrose Avenue once, a man sprinted toward me, his hands imitating a shotgun aimed at me. Bang, bang, bang. Don't you recognize me? I'm Warren in your book, the ending, remember? Bang, bang. He was referring to a character in my book, Bodies and Souls. It's ending. You described me exactly, he said, 
blue eyes, ashy blonde hair, mysterious and great looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be terrific in the movie and I'll send you my contact. <laughs> Not all such street encounters are that benign. One late night on a darkened street, a bear of a man who seemed created by the foggy night came at me shouting his anger at my nonfiction book, The Sexual Outlaw, with its dozens of real people rendered anonymously, among whom I gathered he had seen himself. I made the mistake of turning away from the enraged man only to feel his huge fist pound the back of my head. As I fell, I heard him bellowing my name interspersed with loud curses. When I managed to get up, a flighty young man who had been cruising and had seen the encounter in the area said to me, listen, you can't please everyone. <laughs> At the Wax Museum in Buena Park, I stood before the waxy replication of an idol of mine, Marilyn Monroe, herself a sublime work of art. There, watching in awe, was a pretty teenage girl eating an ice cream cone. With her were two incongruous young men, a lanky cowboy type and a young man dressed in somber black. Out of that brief encounter, I wrote Marilyn's daughter, in which the girl became Norma Lynn, who travels from Texas to Hollywood to find out whether she is the daughter of the great star and Robert Kennedy. The same wistful girl with the ice cream cone became also one of the main characters in Bodies and Souls. Her apparent innocence and the confusion about what she, about what she was in the sinful city and her out-of-place companions fascinated me to the point that I created a whole novel about them. As they wander seemingly without direction about the city, they encounter a whole range of characters all based on real people I had intended to write about, including the televangelist Catherine Cullman, <laughs> a Chicano kid from El Paso who has a tattoo of a naked Christ on his back, the extravagantly beautiful porn star I had seen shunned merely, shunned meanly by everyone at the exclusive restaurant Ma Maison. In my novel, the three wanderers intersect with all the characters only bleeding their times until to a series of impossible, that is, perfect coincidences, they come together in a fiery apocalypse on the freeway. Characters may become uncomfortably real for their author. In the catastrophe that ended that, well, that ends that book, with all the characters on the freeway, 12 of them, who among them would die? Who be hurt? Who would survive? I couldn't bear to decide. So I wrote their names on pieces of paper and blindly assigned a few to each fate. I was appalled by the result. <laughs> a favorite character died. A hateful one lived. I tried to cheat. But finally, I left their fates intact, allowing for the indifferent perfection of accident. Parents feel sadness when their children grow up and, and, and leave, going off into an undefined future. I have felt something of that about my characters, beyond as they go, at, but, uh, something like that in letting my characters go beyond my control. A book ended. But what about their real life and to scenes? Every main character in City of Night, and many in my other novels, novels, was modeled after someone I knew, sometimes intimately, other times fleetingly. When that first novel was published, with all those lives interpreted or misinterpreted, 
I was ambushed by guilt. Since many of the characters I had written about were people in a turbulent world, I wondered whether I had betrayed them by having lived among them, with them, as one of them, and then violently separated from them, becoming a writer, escaping a life that I recorded as one having for most no exit. What I wondered happened to the lazy cowboy who lingered under apathetic palm trees and the warm Los Angeles sun in the old Persian square. He was genial and popular, a cowboy without a horse, no frontier left to discover, living from day to day as long as his youth survived. In my novel, he will always be basking in the warm sun, untroubled, certain that tonight will allow him another tomorrow. In real life, did it. How old would he be now? Alive? The world I shared with him and others was only blocks away from Skid Row, waiting. Today, whenever I see a derelict of a certain age and bearing that uh, the and bearing the etchings of good looks, I wonder sadly, is that Chuck? And what of the real Sylvia, a mysterious woman seeking her exiled son in gay bars throughout the country? In my fiction, I left her longing still to find him, a possibility. In real life, did she find him? Did she give up the search? Did she drown hope in alcohol? I had written about a young man who had been an object of desire in the Hollywood of the 50s. I left him on the brink of aging and accepting redemptive self-knowledge. Years later, when I was hitchhiking, still anonymous, an old sad man, drunk, stopped to give me a lift, and I recognized my once beautiful character, Lance O'Hara. Unfortunately, my worry about the future of fictive characters and their antecedents does not stop with my own characters. I often wonder what happened to Blanche Dubois <laughs> after she was led away, and to Do Nora of a doll's house when she walked out on her husband, to Humbert Humbert, yes, and Lolita. My concern, however, is mitigated when I go so far as to imagine that I extend to them a helping hand, invite them into my own home, invite Blanche Dubois to stay with me. Oh, but how long would she be able to, how long would I be able to cope with her spraying cheap perfume? <laughs> <laughs> Taking steamy baths during hot summers <laughs> spreading feathers from her bow about the house. Those considerations might lead one to sympathize with Stanley Kowalski <laughs> and lead us to escort her back to an institution. <laughs> Consider inviting Nora after she flees the tyrannical husband. How long could one stand her slamming doors? <laughs> And imagine inviting Humbert Humbert and Lolita into one's placid, family-oriented neighborhood. <laughs> How fearful one would become for one's manuscripts if one sheltered had a gobbler to thwart her demise. For me, finally, there is this to justify it all. Within the artistic creation occurs the only means of stopping time. All characters can be brought back to life simply by opening the first pages of a book. Don Quixote begins his quest again. The governess moves undaunted into Bly. Molly pursue, pursues the evasive yes 
of her ruminations. Marcel struggles for his mother's kiss. Tristram delays his birth. Odysseus is on his way back to Penelope. Emma prepares for the ball. Catherine's ghost searches for Heathcliff along the moors. Colonel Lariano Wendia will face the firing squad for 100 years of solitude. In a, in a favorite film of mine, Moulin Rouge, the original one by John Huston about Toulouse Lutrec, as the artist lies dying, the ghosts of those he has drawn appear as they were when he first saw them. Some dancing, others sashaying about, all vibrant, vibrantly alive again. Jaja Gabor, beautiful as Jane April, leans over the dying artist who made her immortal, and she gushes. To lose, to lose, we heard you were dying, and we just had to come and say goodbye. What a beautiful farewell to a writer that would be.